So one of the things we had to do with our spare tire location is to get it integrated with the bike box. This is a huge amount of volume. I think it's 30 inches by the width of the truck, which is around, I should just measure it, so I'm guessing. The thing is we can fit four full suspension e-bikes in here. So we take the front tires off and then just um, alternate directions on the bike frames in here and they kind of hang from the top. We'll do more detail when the bikes are in there. Right now it's empty, but I just wanted to point out that there's a big volume that's been subtracted from the bike box so that the spare tire can rotate up into it. Okay, so this is the bike box. This was a huge project that came together at the very end. We were running short on time on our build and I wasn't even sure if we would have enough calendar time to get the whole thing designed and fabricated to bring the bikes, but we made it and we got in a few bike rides and enjoyed it. So we're glad we brought them. But this box is pretty grubby inside right now. Okay, so if you, this thing is enormous. I'm over six feet tall, so you can see how big this is. You can easily climb up here and sit in here. It's super strong. This is the big volume area that was for the spare tire and the bike frames would did a pretty good job of nesting up and around these. We had a little bit of wear here and there, um, so we're still kind of dialing in the layout of the bikes, but the frames would be suspended from up here. Again, a lot of this stuff is gonna get improved. This is pretty last minute, but those little hook systems worked enough to get the bikes in there. And then we put uh, pieces of blanket and yoga mat, whatever we had between the frames to keep them from getting damaged. But again, fitting four, full suspension e-bikes in here and helmets and other miscellaneous things was really nice. It was, if you look at it, you're, it may not even be obvious that you can fit four bikes in there and it's lockable and it keeps the dust out. So it was really a good solution to put expensive bikes in there. So this is all eighth inch aluminum and has the same geometry as the storage boxes uh, for the ceiling. And then there's a piano hinge up along the top and then these gas springs for lifting it up found a really cool website for designing the layout of these. I've done it manually before and it's kind of a big pain in the butt because you have to worry about so many geometric factors when you lay these out because you need to have the vectors just right. These I wanted to make strong enough so that if we were getting bikes out and it was windy, I didn't want this getting blown down and hitting somebody in the head. Another thing I attempted to do with this is since this is up fairly high, you can't lift a bike, especially an e-bike from this height. Uh, we would take the batteries out, I want, should say that, and put those in a storage box. We could charge them and it would take the weight of the batteries and at least move that up forward on the chassis instead of being back here. So we just ended up using the little extension ladder and putting it up to here. And then with two people, it really wasn't too big of a deal to take the bikes out. My original plan was to lower the spare tire down and then this little bump out here actually has in it heavy duty aluminum slides, kind of like the front porch, so that the winch could then be used to lower this down about 20 inches. So all of the hardware is in here, but we ran out of time to have that um, tested out and functional. So I just kind of welded a bracket in there and locked it in place right now. And I think we'll just leave it there because I like to overdo things and that was just too much. So as an engineer, I really like when things are integrated and far too much effort was put into making sure everything fit well, was just aesthetically pleasing and functional. So a lot of time in our build went towards that. And that was just computer time, um, kind of at the beginning of this year when I was designing everything. So one of the things I wanted to do is not have big uh, fuel fill and water fill and things in the box wall, which I don't really like the look of it and it's also accessible. This is where we put our shore power. So this is a this is a 50 amp, which is overkill, and we could probably change this to a 30 amp now that we have some experience. We never plugged in at all on our trip. We had enough solar and enough from the DC to DC charger, but this is in the bumper. So the the power cord for this goes through the square tube in the back, the five by five square tube, then turns the corner, goes down the rail, comes out into that front storage box and then goes up into the electronics cabinet. But I just like how this was integrated back here. Um, this square fits with all of this and you hardly even notice that it's there. And then on the opposite side, this is the city water fill. And again, I just thought that was a nice 
spot to put it where it's not on the wall of the box as part of the frame. So that water line goes through the frame and then up into the utility area. Storage box is on the opposite side, same size, um, pretty similar function. The fender flare also has the drawer slides on it. I didn't get a chance to put the uh, release pin in there, so it's just bolted in right now. But this can get pulled out and I figured it would be a nice workbench if I had to repair something or work surface for cutting up fish or things like that. So anyway, that's on that side as well. Um, this storage box and what's in it really drove a lot of the design and sizing of these. So this storage box was really driven by that. And that is the condenser unit of a mini split. Um, I did a ton of research to figure out which AC unit was going to give us the most performance in the smallest size. So this one is a 15,000 BTU Mitsubishi unit. It also has heat pump functionality, so it'll heat or cool. But it's 15,000 BTU on cooling, but it can also do like a um, turbo mode up to 18,000 BTUs. A lot of the DC units don't go that high and um, aren't as efficient. Uh, this is a 220 volt system, so we have a split phase power inside with our Victron. Talk about that later. But this storage box just barely fits this condenser unit. Um, the louvers on the back allow the fresh air to come in, cool air to come in, and then it gets pulled through the unit with the fan that's on it. And then there's a big hole on the back wall of this storage box that the air goes out. I didn't have time to test it, just kind of used my experience designing some similar systems in the past and it ended up working super well. So we never had any issues with it overheating or lacking airflow. Uh, the fans on these are so quiet, you can hardly even hear that it's on. You almost have to put your hand back there to feel the air blowing um, to confirm if you're outside just walking around. Yeah, this box is built from the top down. So these, this top, and this is true for all the storage boxes, the top piece right here is one, the first piece that gets assembled to the underside of the box. And then this portion is bolted to it. And then the back wall is put on. So by doing it this way, this, you can see probably that is too large to actually fit out of the opening. So we had to build a box around the AC unit. So the AC unit could get assembled and bolted to this lower portion of the storage box, put into place with the lift cart and then fastened down. That's what this big loop is for. This is the uh, line set. And if we ever have to service this, the box will just have to get disassembled and drop down, but there's enough service loop in the AC system without having to disconnect it. That's why it's there. And then these are just uh, twist lock connectors for 230 volt power. So these storage boxes, I looked around and uh, tried to figure out what kind of hinges would be appropriate. There's a lot of kind of weak looking hinges that are just two little strap hinges with a lot of exposed components on them. So I wanted to go with these piano hinges. They do get a little bit of dirt in them, but with washing or air, you can kind of blast them out and I think they're going to work just fine. The key here is to upgrade to 316 stainless. It always costs quite a bit more than the normal 18.8, but for salt resistance, you just have to have 316 stainless. This is our fuel fill for the OEM fuel tank. So 40 gallons in the back. And again, this is a gas unit. We'll talk about that more, but this needed to get extended and routed up to here. And there's just enough pitch from here into the tank for it to work well. The guy I had working on this had the clever idea. This is actually a diesel filler neck, which is larger diameter. That way I can get the nozzle, the gasoline nozzle, shoved in there far enough to get it to go downhill. Otherwise, there just isn't a lot of slope. And even people that have these 550s with service bodies on them run into the same trouble. There's just not a lot of height difference to get the fuel to flow in there. So anyway, um, the fuel line, and then this is the vent line that comes up here. I thought it was a nice integration to fit it inside the box. Again, the boxes kind of can be locked, so nobody can get to them or mess with them. It's all hidden instead of putting it up here and spilling fuel on here. All right, these are storage box handles. This is another thing that's hard about storage boxes is what kind of handles, where they get placed. You want to, I wanted to have it laser cut in. It's not something I just figure out as you go. So these I looked and found online. Uh, the cool thing about these is they're draw down latches. So I'm folding the handle down, but it does this. And so the ridge on the top part where that strikes goes right up on this surface. Uh, when you 
when you fold the handle down, it actually puts some load on it. So you, this is a sprung load, so it gives it some compression, but that's pretty nice. So this is also adjustable, so you can tighten it up as necessary over time. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about these is if you have the handle latched, and then I don't have a key with me, if the tumbler is locked, so this would rotate up, when that goes up, it pushes this little carrier in this position. And now if I unlock the handle, unfold the handle and turn it, I'm turning it, there's no load, no connection between the handle and here. The reason that's cool is that somebody can't just come along with a breaker bar and try to overpower the mechanics on the inside and, and break it. Um, it just spins. So this just, this just spins. These coatable locks work with our truck key. So if I get out of the cab, I can just walk around and unlock these with the same key, which is pretty cool. These were also available in Chrome. And I got the Chrome version and then had disassembled these and then powder coated these the same as the boxes. So they match perfectly. One thing I'll do is that this lock with these holes, you can use these holes for a three point lock. So in the future, I may add a little striker that goes out to both sides just to add even more security. All right, front driver's side storage box, nothing too special about it, but we do have in here the fuel fill for the auxiliary tank. We wanted more fuel capacity. We're going up to Alaska, uh, going from Fairbanks all the way up to Dead Horse is about 500 miles. This cold foot is in between, it's the only gas station and the one at the end. So anyway, we wanted to have a lot of fuel capacity. This was a really big deal. Originally I thought, well, I'll just put a gas tank right here. I'll just go and fabricate it up because it's just a metal box. Who cares? It's very, very involved. You need baffles. You need to know what size opening and bolt pattern for the fuel sending unit and just all kinds of things that are definitely able to be figured out, but I just don't have any experience with it. And I couldn't find somebody that could give me easy answers to it. So we went a different route after studying this for a very long time and fretting about how much fuel we could bring along what we ended up doing is getting the midship fuel tank from ford and adding that to the chassis with our rear oem tank so just a quick a quick review of what your options are when you order these trucks you can get the rear fuel tank 40 gallons or the midship tank 26 gallons in gas on the diesel chassis you can get both but not with the lariat package Nobody knows why, or you can get one or the other. In hindsight, it probably would have been better to do it in a different way, but what we had to work with was the OEM tank and then adding the midship tank. The midship tank is a transfer tank to the rear, and then it's just all factory from the rear tank forward. So it's pretty straightforward in that regard. If you want to start pulling from two, two tanks and or changing the midship to be your primary tank and the, your rear one to be the auxiliary tank, it's a nightmare. There's all kinds of fuel lines and sensors and vapor canisters and just, it it's terrible. So we took the path of least resistance, leaned on some people in the industry to figure out what my options were and what the best way is to go about it. So the nice thing is you could, we ordered the uh, midship fuel tank and the brackets to go with it. Ford's part numbering system, I've never seen anything like it. It's so messed up. They have these weird systems. I couldn't just go to the dealer and say, I want to add this because it wasn't in their available part numbers for the VIN number that we have. So in other words, their system is set up where you go to the dealer, here's my VIN. They get to look at the parts list and then figure out what you're going to replace. It's not at all set up to let you know what's compatible if you want to add on to it. It took a long time to order brackets and then figure out they're the wrong ones, send it back, and a lot of trial and error. We have all that figured out, so I think we can put together a parts list for anybody who wants to do this system. So we have the midship OEM Ford fuel tank, which is 26 gallons, and that we use with the uh, Titan system for transferring from there to the rear tank. They will not help you unless you have diesel. Nobody wants to mess with gasoline for these transfer systems. Um, they just don't even want to touch it. They don't want to talk about it. I get it, it's probably for liability, but you're just pumping fuel around. It's not that big of a deal. So when I got the kit, the fuel pump on there literally says it is compatible with all of these fuels, like kerosene, gasoline, diesel, blah, blah, blah. And everything else is just tubing and whatever. So it's not that big of a deal. 
Uh, it would be nice if they just got certified for that and could sell it to people. So if you want to do this, you're going to have to piece together your own system. But it'll be the OEM tanks and then running lines uh, to the back using the Titan system, which is controlled in the cab. So that system, you press a button and it will pump for like five minutes. And then if you ran into a situation where your rear tank was full, there's a return line as a safety function, so you can't overfill your tank. And that's one of their concerns, but it's not that hard to put on here. It's the same one that's used for the diesel system. So just a lot going on with the fuel system. It was a huge undertaking. I thought it was not gonna be that big of a deal, but man, it was a nightmare to get that to all happen and work. But the great thing is, We'd normally just fill up the rear tank if we were going on a long stretch in remote areas. I'd fill this one up and then we had almost 500 miles of range. So worked out really well. Or you can use it to buy cheaper gas and get into places and back before having to buy very expensive gas. So fuel fill for the auxiliary tank and the midship. And then the city water comes to here and then goes back up into the box. So this is the drain for winterizing the system. So if I open this up, um, I think I have most of the water out, but it'll probably dribble a little bit. Anyway, this is where we can drain it. And then I probably would want to add an attachment. I, I have most of the water out of the tanks right now. I'm keeping this in a heated garage, so it's not a big deal. I want to get to the point where there's a known protocol that's fairly easy to get air put into the lines to make sure that everything's out if it does have to sit in freezing temperatures for any time. Um, this is also where I kept my air compressor. I just grabbed my shop one. Um, we'll talk about air systems again later, but I will be improving that. I just had a little pancake compressor from my shop. I had to throw it in here last minute to get on the road, but absolutely necessary to have compressed air. I have the compressor for doing the onboard air system. Yeah, it's a two horsepower, and the nice thing is it's run off of 120 volt. There are so many compressors available for DC, but they max out at like one horsepower. They're not very efficient, they're pretty slow. This one's gonna have twice as much capacity and is a much cheaper unit. So that will be installed in here at some point. This is the toilet cassette. So we have the Thetford unit and this worked out really well. It just roll, it just um, comes out of here. It's in a little roller suitcase kind of thingy and it just, I go dump it out. That's my job, I travel with my Wife and two daughters, so this is my job. But no real issues with this, worked really well. The worst part is honestly just installing and cutting a big hole in the box and making sure it's in the exact right spot. This is this is lockable, but I've never locked it. I don't know who would want to steal that if you do, have fun. But I'm not gonna lock it. Garage space. These doors came built in from Box Manufacturer. So Box Manufacturer in Germany makes this unit. They do an incredibly high quality job. I don't think anybody in the world makes boxes as nice as they do. It's a bit of a challenge to get them. They take a long time, they're expensive, but they're super high performance and just top notch for workmanship. So this door they made with a three point latch, uh, stainless steel hinge and drip edge. So this is kind of disorganized at the moment, but when we get to our interior layout, one of the key things we wanted to have is again, more space. So we have tons of storage space that's unconditioned. We also have lots of storage space that is conditioned space. So this is um, kept the same temperature as the box. It'd be a little cooler back here, of course, because of lack of airflow, but um, you can see this goes all the way through the back and there's almost 14 inches of space from the floor up to here. And we went to great lengths to make this space back here for putting things like fishing poles or long skinny things. And then just really a huge amount of volume. This is the same on both sides and it was great. We could probably do with a little bit more organizing in here with some shelves or whatever, but there's enough space to just kind of throw things in and didn't have to worry about packing it in too much. So on our trip to Alaska, we thought we were gonna do some side trips with camping involved, but we never got to that. But all of that camping gear fit underneath that sh uh, shorter area and it was just in the center. So that's kind of thing where things we don't need very often to get put there, things we need to access often are here. So extra, put, uh, extra 
paper towel, toilet paper, and things like that. This is also where we keep our city water. Yeah, this is our dragonfly awning. This thing is stinking awesome. So this is an awning that goes on the passenger side and it's 20 feet by 15, I think. It's huge. Like there's enough room to easily park a picnic table underneath it, lots of camp chairs and do whatever you need. So we use that a few times and it works super, super well. One more chassis related item is the power steps. We got the XLs, which dropped down a little bit farther. And with the lift kit that's on this liquid spring, it was about the perfect height. So they worked really well. The only thing that we noticed over time is that if the truck was kind of um, sleeping for a while, and then you went to open up the doors, right now they come open pretty quickly like that. But there are times where you would open the door and you would step in and it took a, took a bit for the uh, system to put the doors down and hit you right in the kneecap. So that wasn't very cool, but we got used to that. Okay, a couple more items. Up here is the bathroom vent. So that's just the wall vent that deploys. You just push out, press the button and then push it out. It just kind of pops out and vents. We have the whole top of the roof. The flat portion is covered with solar panels and didn't want to have any more penetrations up in the roof. So that's why we ended up with that, that unit. It worked out pretty well. It's a little noisy. I just like things to be really, really quiet. I might improve it with a different fan later on, we'll see. So the Dragonfly tarp that I mentioned is installed in that extrusion. There's an aluminum extrusion, that black track, just below the top corner profile. So we start on the front and it has a bit of a plastic rope sewn into one edge. That just travels along the whole thing. You can push it about halfway and then by that point, somebody can stand on the front step and then pull it the rest of the way. So the, that whole length is covered and then it comes out 15 feet, which is probably like to here. So it's a huge amount of space. I highly recommend the Dragonfly. This was made as a custom unit and the people in Idaho, I think is where they are from, are just fantastic to work with. They answer questions, they make them and everything's super high quality, nice large diameter poles. All of the attachment points have elastic sections to them so it can absorb some wind so it's not going to just get destroyed if a breeze comes up just a super super nice system drain water really well so there was three poles one in the middle here and then two on the sides so we could just have this ridge be the main height the highest point and would drain nicely to the ends and then the ends are such that you can lower one down fairly close to the ground so if you have a wind coming from the side it'll block that out so we had some cool rainy days in Alaska and it was very, very nice to have that. Mm -hmm.